We are here outside the Hugo Black Federal Courthouse in Birmingham. Right behind us, a plea deal has just gone down a day we thought would never come with the Aruban judge's son, Jorn Vandersloot, who we have long believed murdered Natalie Holloway. And today we find out that's exactly what happened. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us. With me, Joe Scott Morgan, professor of forensics, Jacksonville State University, author of Blood Beneath My Feet on Amazon, and star of hit series, Body Bags with Joe Scott Morgan, my longtime friend and colleague, and also my longtime friend and colleague, Cheryl McCollum. She's the founder and the director of the Cold Case Research Institute, and she's a star of a hit series, Zone 7 Podcast. We've been in the courtroom from the beginning and have just come out. And what a day in the courtroom. Today, I can tell you with certainty that after 18 years, Natalie's case, it's solved. As far as I'm concerned, it's over. It's over. Yaron Vandersloot is no longer the suspect in my daughter's murder. He is the killer. I've just walked out of the courtroom. And the last thing I did before I left the courtroom is I got to hug Beth, Natalie Holloway's mother. What an odyssey that woman has been on since her daughter Natalie disappeared so many years ago on a senior trip to Aruba. Heavily chaperoned, everything was going fine until the night before it was time to leave. Natalie was never seen alive again. And today in the courtroom, we finally see in the flesh, not a picture, not an artist drawing, Jorn Vandersloot, the Aruban judge's son, who I have long believed murdered Natalie Holloway and then lied. We've counted up eight to 10 stories he's told, but today a story has survived a polygraph. Not only a polygraph that has been administered by federal experts, but a detailed investigation by, as the judge said, some of the best detectives and investigators in the world. Now, if it weren't, were not for what the judge said, I would not believe one word Jorn Vandersloot spit out in his statement. But I think he told just enough of the truth to get a deal. A lot of people have been whining it's a sweetheart deal. It is not a sweetheart deal. In front of this judge were just two charges, and they dealt with extorting Natalie's mother, Beth, out of $25,000 in exchange for Natalie's remains or whereabouts. Can you believe that? Extorting a grieving mother, offering to tell where her daughter's remains are for money. And of course, he was lying through his teeth. But today, we finally got some answers. And if a federal judge believes it, and a polygraph believes it, and a fleet of federal investigators believe it, I got to stay. As much as I don't like the feds, I believe it too. With me throughout the entire ordeal has been my friend and my colleague, Cheryl McCollum. Also with me, my friend and my colleague, Joseph Scott Morgan. But first, I want to go to a special guest joining us right now. A young lady that went with us to Aruba in search for answers, Ginger Strickland. Ginger. What has Beth been through? It's just been terrible, Nancy. The pain, the grief, the not knowing, and knowing that he was guilty, but not admitting anything until he does agree to get back to Peru with a plea deal or whatever and to where he can go back. You know what's interesting, Ginger? What we learned today in court, and we have not seen the full statement by Jorn Vandersloot, but it appeared to me, Ginger Strickland, yes. uh, from the clues I got in the courtroom, that Jorn Vandersloot bludgeoned Natalie Holloway dead after she refused sex with him. Absolutely. And then discarded her body, disposed of her body at sea. And yes, I'm picking ma'am. that up from a statement uh, Joe Scott Morgan and Cheryl that we heard in court where yes. it was stated, we will never find her body. Don't go anywhere. Okay. 
There's no doubt about it, Nancy. You and I knew from the beginning that's most likely where he put her, period. And here's the thing. Today is a great day because we got a confession. He admitted to murdering her for the first time. So Beth has got some answers today, period. I was just wondering what led up to this moment. What led up? What was happening last night, Ginger? What was happening with Beth? Who was counseling her? Did she stay at home? Did she pray? Could she sleep? Could she eat? I mean, as always, she looked stunning in court, but there was a look in her eyes. And when she turned around mm -hmm. and looked at Jorn Vandersloot and said, you look like hell. I don't right. think you're gonna make it. A lot of people laughed in the courtroom. I did not laugh. Yeah because he is going straight to hell and he did look like hell. He was, um, would you say fleshy? Grungy. He, yeah, he looked grungy. He, he had a lot of arm fat. Yes. He looked old and dissipated and I was shocked when I saw his appearance. Uh, jail and Prue has not been kind to him, but back to Beth. I spent yesterday morning, a, a long time with her yesterday morning, and you know, she, in her mind, is, is happy to get, to finally find out, but Natalie lives on forever. But she was in a good spirit, um, sleeping, I don't think there's been much of that, especially since he's been here eating. You know, I feel like she needs to eat a cheeseburger, but, and it's, you know how it is. She's stressed, she's worried. But I feel like this is gonna be something that gives her some sort of peace. But Natalie will live on. And I'm, I was so proud of her be, for being so strong today in, in court when she spoke I, I to I've gotta him. tell you, I broke down in tears, yes. but Beth did not. She, did. she turned around in that courtroom and she looked right at Jordan Vandersloot and she ripped him a new one. There's really no other way to put it. Okay. With me now, in addition to Cheryl and Ginger, and Ginger, jump in whenever you hear anything that is different from what you know to be correct, or you want to add. Um, Joe Scott, I really want to hear your analysis of what happened. For me, I, you know, when, when I began to hear this information begin to trickle out relative to the cause of death, what we suspect that it is, uh, the term bludgeoning. Did it all up. make sense to you? <laughs> yeah, on one level, but I'm, I'm like you. I, you know, if it had not come from someone else, I would not have believed it relative to him. Uh, Are you trying to say you think he's a liar I and you'd only believe what he says right. if taken with a box of salt? I think that anybody that would put a mama through this as a scumbag is what yeah. I truly believe. Exactly. And he's going to I can't wind believe up. nobody's killed him behind bars. I know. And, you know, he's going to have uh, an interesting life down in Peru, I'm sure, at some point in time, uh, whenever he gets back down there. But this is the thing. We have to understand that this threat of violence runs through him. Remember, we can't forget what also happened to the young lady, Stephanie. Stephanie Tassiana Flores. From what I've heard relative to that scene. Oh, and they referred she, to it today in court. And it was brutal. Yes. And that goes to the brutality that he was capable of. So, I mean, the, did you look at him and think, you are a killer, you are an animal? Well, after as time has gone by, you know, when you see him, he's kind of, you know, when you see him in all of the news reports and everything, uh, over the years, he almost looked, I don't know, uh, adolescent at some point I in time. I never thought that. Like a I rich, a rich spoiled like a, little brat. That, yes. Yeah. But I always thought he looked like a tiger ready to pounce if nobody was looking. Well, quite possibly. But I do know this. I do know that he's got, he's going to get what's coming to him at this point in time. And it's been a long, long time coming. You know, there's a history of violence with him, even I think as it applies to his brother. Uh, at one point in time, he almost killed his brother. So, yeah, the, the fact that what they're saying has taken place is not surprising. And here's, here's my final thought on it. Oh, you're not getting off the hook that easy. Uh, you stay no, right no, there. No, no, no. What I'm going to say is the fact what happened with Natalie's remains, the fact that we will probably, there's a high probability we'll never have anything. Uh, relative to well, just they goes, said that in court, Joe Scott. Just, they, the, it, the, I think it was the judge said, we will never get Natalie's remains. And that I took that to mean that she was disposed of at sea. And I've, I've heard the word in the water uh, relative to what uh, Beth was saying earlier. Uh, and I think that once she slipped beneath those waves, we're never mm -hmm. going to see her again. And that again goes to the dis disregard that he held, the diminishment that he held for this poor girl that was down there 
you know, life was just cruising right along. And so it's, uh, it's quite an amazing thing when you see this display. Um, I want to talk about the fact we haven't even brought up what the sentence was. Mm -hmm. right. Guys, we had to do some quick math in the courtroom. And what I understand is a 240-month sentence. And breaking that down to 20 years behind bars. Now, under the law, the judge ran that concurrently with the Peruvian sentence. And I think that's very important. A lot of people wanted that to run consecutively. However, the judge made it very clear on the record that she thought that would somehow violate the federal sentencing guidelines. So what we understand is this sentence will run concurrently with the Peruvian sentence. The judge made it very clear that should Jorn van der Sloot's sentence be reduced, modified, should he get out early for any reason, that he would have to return to the U.S. to complete sentencing. Is that how you understood it, Cheryl? That's exactly how I understood it. That judge was flawless today. She was not going to make any mistake where anybody could come back and say that he was not treated properly, this was not done correctly. She clarified and then re-clarified and then checked again with every single person, the state, his attorney, and then with Mr. Vandersloot. It was absolutely the most professional thing I think I've ever seen in sentencing. Question, did you for one moment when uh, the judge was asking Jordan Vandersloot, do you agree, do you agree, at any moment did you think he was going to say no and Not pull out? No, I, I don't know. I He's even told lied you so much. I thought that he might. But I even moment. told you yesterday. If you remember, he was truthful about what happened to Stephanie Flores. He admi he admitted it at a point because he was on camera for Pete's sake. But he's caught here. That's what people don't understand. And I said it yesterday, and I'm going to say it again today. He was on film. They had his bank records. They had no reason to make a plea with him. They had him on camera. They had the bank records. The only reason to make a plea is because he was going to tell the truth. And that's what he did to get the deal. And I, we talked about it yesterday. Uh, we are talking about the plea deal that went down with Jorn Vandersloot behind us in the Hugo Black Federal Building. Ginger, I want to focus back on, uh, I want to focus off the legal technicalities and I want to focus on Beth. How did she prepare for today? What was her thinking regarding today? And how do you think she will be tonight? When you see her tonight, I want to know what you think her frame of mind is going to be. Relieved, happy, overwhelmed, sad. I mean, so much of her life has been seeking justice. Exactly, Nancy, it has. Um, you know, she has prepared, she's read thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of documents. And then with this that they received as a plea agreement or whatever, it was just tough, but she pre prepared herself mentally. She's always a strong woman. She has been a strong woman. We saw that when we went to Aruba mm -hmm. not long ago, a couple years ago. Yep. And I feel like she is going to have some sort of closure with knowing does she really believe what Jorn Vandersloot said? You know, at points in time she's told me no. She didn't know because there was so many lies. But I'm like you, how can you argue with the polygraph? How can you argue with um, the things that were, you know, laid out there for us to believe? And the, you, you know, know, I was confused about one thing. I, I think I've got it figured out. Um, the judge said that his confession, his statement about what happened, cannot be used for any other reason other than this proceeding. But she cannot control whether that confession is used in Aruba for a murder prosecution. And Nancy, let's you just hope that? that that can. Relative to the charges in Aruba, or what we would hope that he would be charged with down there, I'm hoping that this is going to exert enough external pressure on him or internal pressure with him that are with them in Aruba, that they would move forward with charges because this is this is obvious. He has made the statement. We're going to find out more information, I think. And if this is not an impetus for the Aruban government to move forward 
I don't know what is, Nancy. And there is no time. statute of limitations. No, there's not. We're talking about a homicide here. He gave a proffer in which he finally confessed that he killed Natalie. He described when and how he killed her. And he said that after killing her on the beach in Aruba, he put her into the water. And that was the last that he ever saw her. It was stated in court that her body, quote, will never be found, which means it had to be disposed of at sea. Those are the facts that jumped out at me. And I would like to say that Jordan Vandersloot, um, it reminded me a little bit of cult mom Lori Vallow, actually brought forth the name of our holy Christ, that he, quote, is a changed man, and that he has, quote, found Jesus. And you know what? I'm glad he has found Jesus, and I hope that's true. I also hope he spends the rest of his natural life behind bars. He can definitely be a Christian behind bars and minister to others. That's not going to happen. That's one thing, too, Nancy. Did you notice when Beth addressed um, your on that she mentioned the four life she did. skills or the four attributes to life that he had and one was that he was a killer the other was that uh he, sex the other was food yeah. yeah and then i think there was one more but anyway that that describes him perfectly and it's like a shark it, it is yeah. a deranged he animal sleeps, has sex, well that's why i r that's r it. refer to him as an animal Sleep because it, it's like this and i've told many a jury this when you're walking along in central park or piedmont park in atlanta and you see a little squirrel run across in front of you is your instinct to go grab the squirrel and tear its neck out with your teeth right. no right. when you see an apple is your instinct to pick it and eat it yes his instinct is to kill when he sees a woman his goal is to rape her, and if she doesn't go along, beat her. Now, that scenario fits with what we know right now. And Joe Scott, Cheryl, jump in on that scenario. Possible, plausible, probable, you first. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the fact that he can be triggered by simply being told no or being resisted in any way goes to this and you use the term animal right yes it goes to almost this primal instinct this this thing and I, again this goes to the spoiled brat type of environment that he grew up in lenient. a spoiled brat sounds like a three-year-old little boy no he's okay let me give you another term he's a feral animal how's that yes, and he that knows no boundaries obviously he he saw natalie i think as an object just like he saw stephanie as an object and probably everybody else that he shook down in those casinos and, and Lord only knows who else, who else got roofied by this guy that never came forward, which again is something that is very troubling because there's a, there might be, for all we know, there's a, a huge population of people out there that are hurting as a result of actions that he took and they've been too afraid to come forward, maybe at this point in time, maybe since they've seen this resolution, some people might step forward and say, you know what, this happened to me. This happened to me and I think he might be the person that had done it. Go ahead. I know I can't stop you. <laughs> no, guys, in the courtroom, Cheryl and I and Dee, who's also with us, uh, were all together in the courtroom sitting across the aisle from Beth and her family. And Natalie's father, uh, Mr. Holloway, was there as well. He, he didn't speak. He let Beth do the talking. And she did an incredible job. For all the crime victims out in the world listening right now, this woman has single-handedly proven you can overcome being a crime victim and you can stand up in court and you can face the attacker. You can because she did. And you know what, Cheryl, we've talked many times. After my fiance Keith was murdered, I thought I knew it all about grief until I had my children. And I can tell you right now, losing your child would be the worst possible thing that could happen. And Beth, I can't say she's overcome it because you never really get over it, but I'm telling you, in court today, she was a tiger. I remember sitting with her in 2005 and she was just broken. When we went to Aruba with her, you know, the three of us were standing with her when she took us back to that cross. And when she told us she fell to her knees 
and just screamed at God to give her baby back. Your heart just gets gutted for her. And then we saw her get a little more empowered as that trip went on. And she even told us, Aruba does not own me anymore. The mama that I saw in there today, let me tell y'all something. That was one of the most incredible transformations I have ever seen. She looked and spoke right to that devil. And she meant it. Hey, when she just said devil, I gotta tell you something. I wish you guys could have been in the courtroom today. We got here really early, and that's a good thing too, uh, because so many people were trying to get into the courtroom. There was an overflow room, but when I saw Jorn Vandersloot walk in, and to me, he looked like the devil in human clothing. 100%. I, I, I very rarely even talk about the devil. I don't want to conjure him up in front of me, but he looked like the devil. He has not held up very well in jail, not that I care, but to look at him and think about all the pain he has caused so many people. Natalie's brother was in court today. Um, so many friends and relatives and well-wishers. I mean, I, Ginger, you've been through H-E-L-L -L with Beth. When you saw him walk in the courtroom, what went through your mind and your heart? It was just a sickening feeling. Just, I just couldn't hardly stand to look at him. That, it was revulsion. It, it was, it was, and it's just, I just thought my heart went out for her because if I, I mean, as a person, I would want to get my hands on him, you know, knowing that you can't do that. But can you, for me, it was just pure gut-wrenching, sickening. He, he looked like a human, of course, but he almost has the superhuman ability to cause pain. Yes. Every time he opens his mouth, yes. it causes yes. pain. You know, Nancy, we were here um, June the 9th. I think, I believe that was the correct date. Mm -hmm. And he looked a little bit better, but that's when he came from Peru to here. So they may have treated him a little better there. Then, but he looked, as Beth said, like hell. And he did. But at that time too, it was just a creepy, grungy feeling that he gave me. My pit, the just a pit in my stomach. How just the same as today. How did Beth respond to say? It was tough. It was tough. She, you could tell it, she's trying to keep cool, but you could tell it was taking a toll on her. You know, uh, many times in court, uh, victims' families will take a lunge at the defendant. Yes. Uh, I've had a defendant take a lunge at me in the courtroom, armed with a pen. Oh, no. If it hadn't been for my investigator and my bodyguard, he would have made it to me because I wasn't really paying any attention to him at that moment. I felt the instinct to make a lunge for Jorn Vandersloot. <laughs> I did too, Nancy. And now, uh, oh, and yeah. another thing, that that courtroom was armed to the teeth with bailiffs, sheriffs, they were armed. There Marshall. were guards protecting the judge. There were guards right up on Jorn Vandersloot in case he decided to make a run for it, which of course he wouldn't do from the Hugo Black building. He would wait for a moment where he's less guarded but no one knew what to expect. And as you see at many sentences, every door and exit was protected by the bailiffs. You want yes. to answer, answer Cheryl? I was just saying, and the marshal service was there, the FBI was there. He wasn't gonna stand a chance if he made any move at all. But I'll tell you something else that stood out for me for Beth's comments when she said, you have a daughter. She's talking right to him. Yes. You have a daughter. What would you want to do to the person that killed her? And she said, I know what I want to do, kill him. I mean, that was a strong woman in there today, Nancy. And we did talk, she and I talked about that yesterday. Cheryl, we, we talked about that, about his daughter and yeah. how, you know, how would he feel? Yeah. How would he feel if someone... Gotta ask you, has Beth ever felt she had to go kill him? Yes. I know okay. what I would say. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because yes. so many times I thought, I should have just killed Keith's killer right then and there. Right. And now that he's out, I'll go track him down. But I look at the twins and I would never have him again. So it's, it's tempting. Right. 
You're exactly right, Nancy. So how do you believe, first to Joe Scott Morgan, uh, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, author of Blood Beneath My Feet, still hadn't come out with the second book yet. Uh, that said, um, I'll go ahead and let Kim, your wife, write your next book again. But um, also star of Body Bags and Cheryl, star of Zone 7. How do you believe the two of you that his story was corroborated? Because I got a really hard time just swallowing that with a silver spoon. Here, here's the thing, you know, it seems like there's this, uh, this continuum where he, and you know what they say, the dead can't defend themselves. And he has on several occasions thrown his dad under the bus. You know, that first, the first thing where he implied that, you know, my father buried her. Remember, he didn't say he did it. His dad took her and buried her beneath the house. Then he said his dad had facilitated getting a boat to take her out there. And that was alluded to at one point in time. Uh, so I, I don't know, I don't know exactly how he was purposed. I think that Cheryl has an idea about these individuals that are still, you know, down in Aruba relative to him. Yeah. And, you know, are they part of this? Did they facilitate a boat? Did they get her they remains out the there? They were in the car when they left Carlos and Charlie's. They have to know what happened. And they have knowledge of it, yeah. So I think that that goes to the deposition of her remains. Where did they place her at that particular time? Did they place her into a boat? Did they walk her out into the surf? And that's, you know, that's something I don't know that we'll ever get specific wait answers minute, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now with this confession that he has proffered to this court, yep. I'm sure it can't be used for any other reason in the U.S., but could it, along with the testimony of Satisha Deepak Kelpo, murder prosecution of Jorn Vandersloot. It absolutely should. It should be happening today because they got a confession in a court of law that was corroborated by the FBI. So for Aruba at this point not to take action should tell everybody if you go to Aruba, you are not safe. They're not going to protect you. If something were to happen to you, they're going to help cover it up. You made the best point when we were in Aruba. We were there 15 minutes, and you said, in 15 minutes, you have been willing to arrest Beth Holloway, but in 15 years, you won't arrest Johan Vandersloot for Natalie Holloway's murder. I don't know what else people need to know about that island. So now that they've got this, they should absolutely move forward. So my question is, when the dust is settled and Beth goes back, to hum back home, what will her life be like now? Because her last 20 years have been seeking justice. And will Aruba act? Uh, last, will we ever find Natalie's remains? Let's start with you, Cheryl. We're not gonna find Natalie's remains because they were so far out in the ocean. You've got turtles, you've got sharks, you've got the water, it, fish, it's done. And that's okay. Beth had, I think on some level, she's known that. Now she can take that and prayerfully find peace and move toward what she said today in her statement. She's got grandchildren, her son. She's gonna focus on that. She's gonna focus on her students. And I pray for her this piece because she wears that bracelet, you know, hope, faith, and love. She's got all of that. And she said, I Natalie disagree. is forever 18, and I just hope that's what she's heard got. heard that in the courtroom. I heard her say that in the courtroom. But I am telling you, when you have your child snatched away from you, you will never have peace. It would not surprise me at all to see him continue to try to bait people, particularly those in Aruba, perhaps, and maybe people here, in order to get back into that spotlight. And, and this is what I do know. I don't believe anything that proceeds out of his mouth. So you have to have investigators like we've seen demonstrated here today, Nancy, that can corroborate these things that he has put forth. And they've done a jam up job at this point. Let's see what the future holds relative to him if he's cool in his hill somewhere and he's desiring to get beyond this weight that's gonna be placed on him in this environment. And to one of Beth's very dearest friends who went with Cheryl and myself to Aruba, like, where were you when I was getting arrested? 
hiding was, in the car with Cheryl. I was running from the back right. trying to I get there. I turned around, I could see his rear end and <laughs> elbows from those two running. And Beth and I were there getting like, handcuffs oh, no. thrown on us. But that said, let bygones be bygones. Right. Uh, I'm just thinking about Beth tonight. When we all go home to our families, and I go home to my little girl and my big boy and my husband, Beth is going home with the memory, just the memory of Natalie. And I can tell you, we're going to be praying so hard for her tonight. And she put on a good face in the courtroom. She said, Natalie, as Cheryl just said, will be forever 18, forever beautiful, forever hopeful, forever full of potential. But in the dark hours of the night, I wonder how she's going to get through it. Now that this part of her life, this quest is over for now. And that's what I was going to say, Nancy. We're just going to continue to shower our love on her as a family, as a school family mm -hmm. that we are. Um, Beth has so many friends and so many people that care about her in our county and in our community and feel for her. And they want to love on her and shower her with love. And her students love her. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. The students just absolutely love her. And I think that's one thing that's going to get her through these long days and nights. You know, another thing that I want to pass on to her is that there are a lot of mothers and a lot of fathers across our great country that are suffering because their child is missing or has been killed. And Beth really is an example for them that they can go on and that no matter how long it takes, you can get justice. I know it's cold comfort sometimes, but you can get justice for your child. So that's a big burden to put on her shoulders, but it's already on there. I didn't put it on her. It's on her. If not for her, we wouldn't be here. No, if not for her continued quest to find out what happened to Natalie, we would not have this day in court. So the prosecutors, the investigators, the polygraphers, they all did their part, but we would not be here without Natalie's mother, Beth. So tonight, if you're listening right now, say a prayer for her and her family. Goodbye, friend.